I, I think the way you look at it is that as a startup, you can move a lot. Quicker. You don't have to sign 10, 20 things off to get approval. You, if you want to do something, providing the, the team agrees, you can move a lot faster. In the US, it's like disruption. In Asia, it's like finding a way how you can get these corporates on the cap table as well, but not get it to a limit where it's not fundable in the next round. Welcome to Brave. Learn from Southeast Asia's best tech leaders. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. No BS on success. I'm Jeremy Au, venture capitalist, Sierra founder, Harvard MBA, science fiction nerd, and dad of two daughters. Every week, we debate startup news, interview change makers, answer listener questions, and share personal insights. Join our movement of over 40,000 members and get transcripts, resources, and community at www.bravesea.com. Stay well and stay brave. Grain is an online restaurant that serves healthy yet tasty meals on demand and catering. They are backed by investors including the Lo and Behold Group, TE Jia, Open Space, and Sento Ventures. Their meals are thoughtfully created by chefs with wholesome ingredients. For the month of April, Grain has teamed up with HGH Maimona to bring you a quirky yet delightful experience for the first ever Michelin-inspired catering in Singapore. Learn more at www.grain.com.sg. If you ever need to feed your teams or family, go check out Grain. Hey, Richard, really excited to have you on the show. So you're a VC and you're covering quite a unique range of geographies across Southeast Asia. So I wonder if I take the opportunity to share your story. Could you share a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so thanks, Jeremy, for having you on. I've heard so many good things about your podcast. And yeah, as I say, so many people recommended me to have a session. So I'm glad we managed to find some time. So yeah, a bit about me. As I say, I'm half Thai, half British. I was born in Thailand. I grew up in quite a few countries around the world. I lived in Australia. I lived in New Zealand, Malaysia, England, Ireland. So as you probably imagine, emerging countries to develop countries. It gives you a strong understanding of people, technology, things like that. So extremely good for that chance. And so, yeah, as I say, the countries I've lived in and then my entrepreneurial journey started out starting a e-commerce company in the creator space. And then the second company was in the more in the, the food waste space and then ended up angel investing. And then now at TAV as a venture partner leading up their emerging markets. So guess how that's my career evolved and happy to dive in deeper in any of those topics. Awesome. So could you share about what was it like growing up? Yeah. So, I mean, as you could probably imagine, as I mentioned, living in all those countries, I moved around quite a lot, right? And I guess in terms of when I moved around, you met new friends, you moved around and you lost them and things like this. So my parents were expats. So whenever they went somewhere, we would go somewhere. So I think it was really good. Uh, the experiences were great because you got to try out all these different traditions and also learn different things from a really young age. So it helped us really adapt. I think that was very important, right? So I would say that's something we learned uh, at a very young age to quickly adapt to whatever the current situation in or whatever the country we're in. That's great. And so how did you get started in technology and entrepreneurship? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I could say a bit of it came from my dad. I mean, even though my dad comes from a bit of corporate background. He was always into tech for a while and he wanted to start his own thing and things like this. So from a young age, we were always bouncing ideas off and eventually, and then me just growing up and learning it, hearing about all the different entrepreneurs all over the world. And also, as I say, reading, I used to read a lot as well. And just wanting to learn new things is very important for me. So from a young age, I think I realized that the corporate space was probably not for me. I wanted to be my own boss or as I can say, or control my own sort of situation. I, I would say not be in a sort of the nine to five. So I learned from that from a young age and starting my first company at around like 19. And it's like scaling that up to possible business. And then as you say, we're zero VC dollars raised was, was great. And that sort of got me a bit about entrepreneurship and then understanding like the good things and the not so good things, right? The late nights and everything like this, but it, it got me a good taste. And as they say, the second business was more of the startup side because we actually raised money. That was a food waste company, but I was an investor there, just mainly handled the fundraising. So it, it sort of allowed me to these two startups I founded sort of gave me a bit of an idea on one from a, I guess, building a profitable business and then the other one building a venture business, right? So looked at it from both lens and then both those things really helped me sort of understand the, the ins and outs of being an entrepreneur and then eventually building up my network as well allowed me to go in the VC space, which is where I think I was best suited for over the last few years. So yeah. 
Awesome. What are some myths or misconceptions about media and creator from your perspective? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think there's a combination, right? I think the misconceptions is that people think that every creator has not a strong business understanding of things, right? But there's actually some very smart creators out there. If you look at all the top creators, right, they have a very strong team with them. They understand business or their area probably more than even saw people that are building creator businesses in the startup space, right? But I, I think that's a big misconception because even though they might not look that, okay, they're like business savvy or tech savvy on paper, but to get to where they are, they, as they say, they're in a league of their own, right? And they understand whatever they do to a very high level. So I think that's probably the biggest misconception. The second one I would probably say is that that all creators are super well off or all media people are super well off. That's not true. I mean, I would say, I mean, you and I know this, right? Is a lot of the creator revenue and things like this is driven by 1% of the celebrities or, or, or media people, right? 99% of the other revenue isn't actually um, like goes to them, right? So in terms of like Spotify, that's the same as well. The top 1% artists. So I think that's the second biggest misconception, right? People are like, oh, wow, you have a million followers or something like this. Oh, you're making like tens of millions of dollars. That's just not the case, right? I think it, every sort of creator or media celebrity is, is, is different. I think that's sort of the two biggest misconceptions uh, with people outside the media space and outside the, I guess, the investing landscape, they wouldn't understand. So yeah. People really want to be famous, right? People want to be creators and that seems to have been Obviously, the tail is all this time, I guess, but yeah. it still seems to be uniquely internet driven, right? The TikTok, like Instagram. What are your thoughts about this? I, I think it's a combination of things. Some people aspire to be top movie stars. Or, I mean, nowadays, kids really want to be like, you know, they want to have like tens of millions of followers in, on TikTok. That's what they aspire to be. That's how this generation has changed or have a massive YouTube channel, right? But I mean, in a way, it's actually kind of smart because what they don't realize is, as they say, even by having this massive distribution channel, they're really able to leverage themselves in many ways. Maybe they're able to build businesses, maybe they're because they have this massive audience, right? Let's say have a couple million followers on YouTube, a couple million followers on TikTok. They're able to really leverage to grow businesses, to launch new product lines, to, to do collaborations where they couldn't before, right? So I think it's sort of understanding the why behind they want to do it, right? To some people, they want to just do it for the fame or do they just want to do it for as i say to improve their lives or as i say because they want to they see a massive problem or they see a massive niche gap and they think that they're the best for it so i think that i, I think you could put it into three of those buckets so in this case we're seeing a lot more people probably for the one that they're realizing the power of technology and the power of, or of like the internet and saying that okay by being a celebrity influencer things like this they're able to build their personal brand right i think this is what the new generation is realizing so yeah and how did you transition or why did you want to transition into venture capital yeah so i mean it's, as i said i was angel investing a bit here and there i mean i've built up a bit of portfolio so far but in terms of it's sort of developed right i think for me being on the founder side and really understanding having bootstrapped the company as well and also raise money before it's sort of seeing both sides of the picture right and coming from a market like thailand where capital is very hard to come by in terms of capital and resource, you have to do like a lot, not much, right? Put it that way. And so it's really taught me that angle. And then not just that, but VC has always been a very closed industry for anyone that's outside the industry. And in terms of the access and things like this, people view VC as, oh, you can only really get in or you can only be that if it's from inside. And it's just, built, which is somewhat true in some ways, but in terms of it's, there is actually ways as well, right? So I think it's from having, building up that strong network from a young age as well, and able to sort of give back and also help operators, founders, and things like this, who are first time capital, open the doors for them where it was a bit harder for me when I was raising capital, when I was like raising money for SPVs and, and things like this. So yeah, in a way, wanting to do it for Thailand and also other emerging markets, um, I would say that's probably why I started going to venture then. I mean, I love to explore new technologies. I think being able to pick the best, solving like the biggest problems all over the world and then speaking to them every day and sort of deciding if you can be on the ground floor of the, that particular company is, I don't think there's a, probably a better job in, in the world than this. As I say, it's sort of different to being, I don't know, in public equities where you're just like trading already massive large companies or private equity, right? Where you're, you're just buying and selling large businesses, right? So venture early stage. Yeah, I think that's the best area to be. And I think they also, add, the right ones also add a lot of value. And could you share more about what that transition has been like for you? Yeah. I mean, like, I think at the very beginning, it was quite tough, right? Because I mean, I was sort of an outsider and, uh, you know, coming into 
the industry and things like this. I still remember a while back trying to speak to as many people as possible, just network as much as possible, meet, meet as many people all over Southeast Asia or other emerging markets as much as possible. But in terms of a lot of people, I would try, you know, do something for them. I just try to help them out, whatever they need. And then a lot of people actually gave back and like help endorse for me. But then you have some that didn't, but I guess that's with everything, right? So there were a few people that really helped me open doors, build up a strong network. And I think at the very beginning, I was trying to get my hand on as many pitch, right? Just seeing different business models and everything like this. But now I've seen probably like over a thousand or something like this. So I've just, now I probably want to see less pitch decks, but before it was like getting as much information as I can, learning a bit of, a lot about venture, being an outsider and building my network because venture, as they say, it mainly it's returns and also like access, right? And also how much value you can, as they say, those are combination things. So everything is built on your network. So I think if you have the best network as well, you can get in the best deals, talk to the best founders, add the most value and things like this. And as an angel, I tried to do that as much as possible. And that how I transitioned to, you know, being at a venture capital. So what are you covering in venture capital? Yeah. So I'll tell you a bit about the fund I'm at. So TAV is a global venture firm. We've done around 220 investments to date. Around two, out of those 220 investments, we've been able to exit around six IPOs, 12 unicorns. So we've had a pretty strong track record, right? I mean, we're already investors in Cambria and Adore Me, which sold Victoria's Secret, in Europe, Depot, some So we're global, right? Put it that way. For me, I, I'm mainly focusing on the emerging market side, but I cover, as a global firm, we don't restrict any geography or necessarily any like region. I put it that way. And we want to be sector agnostic as well. We back the team, we back the founders, right? And mainly have pre-seed and seed. So, so I guess we can say that's what I look at everything in terms of I'm a generalist, but in terms of the areas I mainly spend a lot is probably in healthcare, e-commerce, marketplaces, anything consumer related, you know, because having that consumer background as well, also having the media angle as well, and able to look at the two together, I think is, is a massive superpower to have. So, yeah. What do you think about the region, right? So obviously there's Southeast Asia, but you know, you obviously have a lot of exposure to different countries and different business models. How do you think about the different geographies? Yeah, I mean, look, the world's a big place, right? But I think you could put the different geographies into different buckets. Southeast Asia, there's a lot of characteristics similar to Latin America. I think all the destinations of these these regions and, you know, maybe you put Africa in that bucket as well. All these regions, they are emerging, right? So they're growing very fast. They're growing rapidly. The GDP per capita is rising. And also, as they say, the population's young, the rate's high and things like this. But they all have risks. For example, in that time, we'll take the risks of currency fluctuations, things like this. Risks with inflation, geopolitical risks and things like this in Southeast Asia. Certain markets, we have geopolitical risk as well and things like this. So I, I think there's a lot of similarities in terms of, I would say spending power is a bit higher, but in terms of characteristics, infrastructure. So as I can say, there's a lot of these models as well that have just worked in the US and Europe and people are just being replicated here. But there's a lot of these localized models that are slightly different as well. So obviously being in US and Europe as well, you see all these models from like a high level, but then in emerging, you see a lot of models being much more, I guess, developed and picked for that particular job right? So I would say that's how I put the region into buckets, but I'm very excited for healthcare in Southeast Asia. I mean, that's why we back like HD and stuff. And then also like in Latam, I'm excited for businesses like the food waste space and the sustainability space. Um, you know, example, the company I back was Mercado Differente, right? So yeah, there's certain sectors I like in the e-commerce and things like that. So yeah. Can you share more about what are some things not to do in Southeast Asia? I mean, look, I, I think in terms of this, there's quite a lot of business models that don't work for Southeast Asia. I would say things like maybe consumer subscription is quite hard as well, just based on spending power and things like this. People, if you look at sort of the Maslow hierarchy of needs, buying subscription to this startup isn't the most valuable thing, right? Or this isn't the most important thing. So I'd say things like consumer subscription is, um, I wouldn't say it's probably shouldn't do, but you could try, but very people would su succeed on this model. Right. And the second thing is probably SaaS, B2B SaaS and things like this. I think B2B SaaS, because I mean, let's not put Singapore in this bucket, right? Let's talk about like Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, and things like this. I think you got to be very smart to solve SaaS or you got to be solving SaaS for uh, a particular level, right? So for example, one of my portfolio companies is a company called Ofra, right? They're focusing on like the level below enterprise for SaaS, right? So the ACV contracts are like five to 10K. So they're not 30, 40K, 50K. There is an opportunity there. But when you're focusing on like SME SaaS, it's very hard to monetize. In Indonesia, other markets like in India, like Mercado Books and all those models, right? So those are probably two as well. The third one I would say is probably maybe general AI companies for Southeast Asia. I think to build a strong AI company, you, you need to build it for the world, right? Maybe you start off in Southeast Asia and you leverage the engineering talent or the te technical talent and then you sell 
globally, right? You see a lot of models in India doing that. They're not just selling in India, but they're selling globally. So I would say those are the two, but then the third one is more of an opportunistic one. What's interesting, of course, is that there's a lot of excitement about, for example, Thailand. Can you share a little bit more about your thoughts, because we as previously shared about how Thai economy is very strong within the startup ecosystem has been relatively weaker than what the fundamentals would suggest. So I'm just kind of curious how you think about that. Yeah, you're totally right there. I, I think in terms of Southeast Asia and, and things like this, in Thailand Pacific, Thailand has a massive market opportunity. You know, as you say, it's one of the highest GDP per capita in the region. The economy is relatively strong, but for some reason, they don't get the amount of startup into, uh, attention as, you know, like Vietnam. But in a way, like for me, I've been saying for a while now that Thailand is one of the markets I'm much more bullish on than Southeast Asia. And as I say, the data shows that it's heading the right way. I mean, if you look at the bull market, everyone was like, oh, why are you investing in Thailand? Why don't you just do Philippines or actually, no, maybe Vietnam and Indonesia, right? Philippines, there's actually some opportunities there. And then see no value. There's too much political risk in Thailand. I probably view the political risk in Thailand less so than other emerging markets. Other markets, especially with the change in leadership and sort of heading in the right direction. I think you're going to get a lot more startups and funding capabilities. And there is still a gap in the funding needs, but that, that I think is an opportunity. But you have that gap in the market where you have founder, you have like angels that do 10, 20K, and then you have invest, you have like CVCs that do two, three million, right? You don't have anyone to fill in this sort of gap. As they say, there's a few players that are filling in that gap, but it's not in depth, right? They're not like solely focused on that region. And I think that's what the ecosystem needs. Sort of there's 100K to get the team going, a strong team, things like this. But yeah, but in a way, it's a good thing because Thai founders have always had it much harder to build. They have to do with more, they do more with less. And I think that's a very important trait to have, whether it's a bull market or a bear market. And then but in a way that helps set them up for their later stage rounds and profitability and things like this. So in a way, if it doesn't change too much, if people are interested in the areas, it's still an opportunity. Like the data shows them heading the right way. But if it does change, I think Thailand could quickly change much more appealing market in eight months. But it's just, as I say, just look at how things change in markets like Pakistan, Bangladesh, even Indonesia, right? Everyone was like, oh, wow, Indonesia, we're super interested in the market. And then all of a sudden, like a year later or two years later, it's like, oh, valuations are too high. We're going to focus on, I don't know, Singapore. As they say, the sentiment changes very quickly. I think it's, as they say, that's why you need to have your own thesis and your own hypothesis. Talk more about the capital gap that you see for the Thailand ecosystem. Yeah. So, I mean, look, as I mentioned, and also have been at raised capital and stuff like this. As a founder, even a strong founder, it's hard to raise money in Thailand. Because as I mentioned, in Singapore, in Vietnam, in any region, in other, in Southeast Asia, you have someone that sort of does the seed, right? In Thailand, you don't. You used to have 500 that did that, right? But then they sort of spun off and then started doing Series A and stuff like this, which a lot of people do Series A, you know? So it's more so, you know, that pre-seed and seed, that first capital in, which is actually could be the lifeblood of the company or make or break that business. So no one is actually filling in that gap. I mean, I've been talking to a few friends and we do a few SPVs here and there on really great businesses for Thailand and then 100K, 200K ticket sizes because that's sometimes all a founder needs. They don't need three, four million. I, I always make the joke that in Thailand, if you raise like 200K, 300K, it's like raising three or $5 million in the US because I mean, you have so many more options in other regions, even Singapore as well. Right. So, yeah, but I think this will change soon. But I mean, now it's the opportunity if the investor sees it, they should go after it. So, yeah. And you said that Thai founders have adapted to this. How do you think they have adapted to this? Yeah. I mean, because in a way, whether it's a bull market or bear market, right, they don't have much capital to rely on as a founder in Indonesia or a founder in Vietnam. They've had to, as I say, maybe the company in Indonesia raises 3 million. The company in Thailand maybe only raised 500K, right? So even though like engineering talent and everything like this is similar in prices, they're at they they say, okay, hey, we have to get to break even a lot much more easier than this other company because this could be our last fundraising round. And then that mindset in a way is good for us investors, right? Because we're like, hey, if there's less funding rounds and things like this, there's going to be less dilution, which ultimately benefits us investors. We see a lot of IPO companies and things like this, where a lot of the teams and a lot of the investors own like barely any percent of the company, right? If they exit for a billion, it still probably doesn't even return the fund. So, yeah. And could you share more about when you think about this, you said that you think that Thailand in about two years, could you share a little bit more about what those factors are that you think are important for this to happen? I think it was obviously the first one is a key one. I mean, as I say, someone filling in that funding gap, which could take someone to say, hey, I want to do like a $5 million fund or a $10 million fund for Thailand. And I think we'd be on the right track there. But I think the things we need, like, you know, government support on uh, funding capabilities and things like this, you see 
even countries like Bangladesh, right? They have this sort of startup funding thing where you do, or just even Singapore, right? They have the match for match program, right? Where if an investor invests this much, they will put in this much, right? So it's just things like this. And then offering these services, I think is very important. So I think those things will help a lot. And also I think in terms of once more, I guess, investors come and start to see the appetite, which is starting to happen. I think Thailand is more attractive for FDI with their recent political changes as well, which will be good for Thailand and their overall landscape. But I guess we'll see. When it comes to Thai startups, what are some industries that you see or patterns that you see and the type of problems they go after and how they go after them? Yeah, I, I think, you know, as I say, I have really strong founders in Thailand, like some of the ones the leading companies that are probably going to IPO in the next 18 to 24 months, providing the there is a liquidity in the market. But I think it's a combination of things. I've seen a lot of these founders focus on B2C because they say there hasn't been many B2B companies to that certain extent yet. So B2C is the first thing. And then you see verticals like you know, healthcare, logistics, uh, as they say, just anything e-commerce or anything related where you got to work with vendors. Like you're not just say central or you're working with like multiple people, right? Because in a way, it's actually kind of good if you work with multiple people because then less there's less like one of the Thai businesses uh, build it. Because if you're just working with them, they'll say, okay, we'll just build ourselves. But if you work with all the players, then they need right? Because you you drive a certain amount of revenue to their bottom line as well. That's really fair because one of the big debates is that in the West is very much like about disruption of yeah. incumbents, right? But it feels like in Southeast Asia, there's a lot more partnership. How do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's good, right? In terms of, I, I think that's a risk of emerging markets as well. You know, you have the risk of like uh, the large players going to build it out themselves. I, I think the way you look at it is that, you know, as a startup, as, as a young company, you can move a lot quicker, you know, than them, right? You don't need, you don't have a lot of the sign 10 20 things off to get approval, some things, right? You, if you want to do something, providing, the, as they say, the team agrees on it and things like this. So as a startup, you can move a lot faster. And I, I think in terms of this is good for a company. In the US, it's like, you know, disruption, I think. And in, in Asia, it's like finding a way how, you know, you can get these corporates on the cap table as well, but not get it to a limit where it's not fundable in the next round. So it's like it grows to a certain level. And then, as they say, where it may be less than you cap they own like 10, 20% of the company. That's it. You still have control and stake. That's important. And then you agree a fair partnership with them. That works because that ensures that the company actually survives. But what sort of happens in emerging markets as well is that once the companies get to a certain point is that they take on this larger company in, in the country and they sell 30, 40%. And if 40, 50% is owned by a, a large corporate, if it's not an acquisition, what interest what the next investor want to invest and the founders own less than what motivation is there to them to be there still. So I think it's just making sure that it makes sense from a business perspective and then finding a way to partnership because it can work and it's done being done. It's just like some things you have to like navigate. Yeah, as a founder in emerging markets. Could you share a story about a time that you personally have been brave? Yeah, so for me, growing in all these countries and living up, moved around a lot. And one of the times I was being quite brave was when my family and stuff moved back and I actually made the decision to go to boarding school by myself from a young age. And actually, to think about that, it probably shaped the way I was today and helped me like sort of think the way today. Because, I mean, coming from that, growing up as well, I went to international school and things like that. So it was a different landscape. And then going to boarding school just made me much mature and independent, right? So I would say deciding that from a young age was probably be like, key moment in helping me think and sort of have the mindset I have today. So I think it's a very growth mindset, right? It's something that, you know, where I'm, I'm still relatively young, but in terms of, you know, I've done a few things here and there, right? But I don't look, I've done this and that. I look at it as I'm learning every day. I think that's a, that's the important thing for me. So having that mindset of willing to take the risk as much as possible. And as I say, I, I, I always said this before as well, the best, probably the most important advice I've ever got is take moonshots when you're young, right? Because if it works, it works very well. And if it doesn't, you learn an important lesson very early, right? So yeah, I would say that's a mindset I've had is, is a very growth mindset. And as I say, never stop learning. I mean, it's adventure, moonshots technically, right? So somewhat, you know, some pitch checks in here and there. But no, I mean, in general, right? I think it's a combination of things. I think it was everyone like sort of going through that traditional way of a lot of people, and especially in Southeast Asia or other emerging markets, right? It's sort of like, okay, you do this, you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and then you have a family, you get married and things like this, right? It's sort of that combination of things, right? You get a job, you climb a corporate ladder and you do this and things like this, right? But for me, I guess I wanted to sort of do my own thing and create my own path, right? Sort of being an entrepreneur as well from a young age, doing many things. And then was I say, investing in startups and then going to venture, right? So I, I would say it's a different path to like the, I guess the average person, but I mean, a lot of the people that build their own sort of path and create that. So yeah.
when you think about that unique path, what aspects make it unique? I know that one aspect of it for you has been your social media presence and being a creator as well. So can you share more about that? Yeah, I mean, that's only a combination of things. It's a combination of being a sort of a, a global citizen and then also moving around a lot, understanding like a, a lot of things in terms of understanding like different markets, countries, things like this, and then having that operator background and then from a young age as well, and then having that venture background as well and having this strong network. So it evolved. And I think that's, as I say, how it landed in venture. And then the media angle, as I say, over a period of time, I have a bit of a media, how do I say, background as well, right? So my day job is venture capital, but, you know, I, I do have a bit of a entertainment background as well, right? So actually my family a bit come, come from this as well, because my sister is a well-known movie person, like a movie star, things like this in, in Asia. And I guess doing these things and then some opportunities opened up, you know, as for me, it was like, okay, my day job is venture capital. But in terms of if I want to craft my edgy more, how do I have something very unique? Because I mean, you and I know PC is probably one of the most competitive industries out there. You need to have an edge, but you need to have an even greater edge than the typical Harvard or Stanford guy. And it's sort of like crafting that. So it's like, in this case, it's like, okay, but the media engine as well that's massive because this is a venture firms they're building as well they spend millions of dollars so if you can build your own it's massive right so yeah that's sort of the combination because you have that distribution and you know which is i think is a unique thing you can offer because if you can say to a founder that hey maybe you start a fund or something right and you're like okay i can give you know a couple hundred thousand or three hundred five thousand but the round is oversubscribed right but i can offer you this massive distribution this media leverage that no other fund in the region can offer you that in itself why wouldn't a founder take them a cap table, right? I think I realized quite a lot of times as well as an angel investor, some beneficial things as well. So as they say, doing a few media projects, I was finished up doing a film in the Philippines. I have another two uh, this year. But yeah, look, my day job still venture. Yeah, I, I do a few films as well. So yeah. Uh, on that note, I'd love to summarize the three big takeaways I got from this conversation. First of all, thank you for sharing your early uh, entrepreneur experience and how you explain the uh experience around media and what you've taken away, some of the myths and misconceptions about creators and revenue and what it takes to succeed. And secondly, thanks for much for sharing about why you transitioned to venture capital and some of the different aspects about venture capital that you thought this are hard versus easy and why it takes to have an edge in the system. And lastly, thanks so much for sharing about Thailand as an ecosystem. You heard it first that, you know, you believe that this market may turn around in the next two years and I mean, several factors. Yeah, I think it should. You know, I think in terms of a lot of investors are starting to realize and there's a lot of quality companies. I mean, you just saw like HD just Series A. It's opened the path for other companies and other investors to sort of understand the region as well. So, yeah. Awesome. On that note, thank you so much, Richard, for coming on the show. Enjoy the journey. Glad to be on. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. We would also appreciate you leaving a rating or review. Head over to www.bravesea.com for member content, resources, and community. Stay well and stay brave.